tonight we're going to be dealing with part number two on the damage from defiance and dis density. We talked about in Isaiah chapter number nine this morning how God was chastening the, na the nation of Israel. They had been disobedient, hard-hearted, stubborn, and God was chastening the country. He allowed the Assyrian army to come in and just ransack uh, the northern tribes, uh, but God's people were not getting the message. Uh, they didn't realize that God was, was spanking. They were basically uh, saying, well, we'll just, we'll just rebuild and we'll have better barns. We'll uh, replace the bricks with hewn stones. We'll build better quality buildings. We'll replace the sycamore trees with cedar trees. And uh, uh, we'll have uh, just so many wonderful things that we can do. We'll just rebuild on the ashes. Well, that's very positive. But the problem was this. God's people were living in sin. And the problem was getting worse. They were only making matters worse in their life. They were stubborn. They were rebellious. So <clears throat> we, we left off this morning with this question. <clears throat> what is the cost of stubbornness? What happens <clears throat> when, when we get stubborn toward God in our life? What are the consequences of having that attitude in our life. That's what we're going to deal with tonight. So let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your word, the practicalness of it. And Lord, help us to learn intently tonight the cost of being stubborn towards you. What price do we pay when we're rebellious towards you? We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your Bible, look at Jeremiah chapter 7 tonight. This is where we'll begin. Jeremiah chapter 7. Here's point number one stubbornness toward God. It causes us to be uncommitted and unresolved to serve the Lord. We become uncommitted to the Lord, unresolved to live our life toward, for Him. Now here's what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 7, 24. But they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsels and in the imagination of their evil heart and went backward and not forward. Notice the word imagination there. It comes from the word sherry ruth, which means stubbornness, hardness, or firmness. This word comes from a Hebrew root word, which means twisted or firm, like a rope that is made hard and firm by being twisted together. See, beloved, when we are stubborn, our heart gets hard. Our heart gets twisted. It's knotted and bound in rebellion. And God doesn't want us to get into that condition. Because when we get stubborn and hard-hearted, then the commitment issue goes out the door with God. We don't want to be committed to Him. We don't want to be serve Him. There's no conviction in our life to live our lives for the Lord. When well, that happens in our life. Now, here's a second thing. Look at 1 Samuel chapter number 15 and look at that 23rd verse. We see stubbornness toward God makes us unfaithful in our worship of Him. In fact, God considers our stubbornness as idolatry. Look at this, 1 Samuel 15, 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as iniquity, and look at this, and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. You know, the word iniquity here is from the Hebrew word avin, which means the trouble or sorrow that comes from iniquity. It comes from an unused Hebrew root word that not only means to pant or exert yourself, but to exert yourself in vain. A stubborn spirit leads to trouble in your life. Uh, it leads to sorrow, and it leads to dissatisfaction that comes from trying so hard to get your own way, but to no avail. Sorrow comes from also getting your own way 
and finding out that getting your own way doesn't make you happy. It doesn't satisfy your needs. Many stubborn, selfish people have found that getting your own way doesn't leave you satisfied at all. They find that once they get their own way, they are not happy when they presumed that they would be. You know, many find they get what they want. They get what they want, but then they lose what they had. Rebellion is compared to idolatry here because we have exalted our own will above God's will and word. What we want to do is more important than what God wants us to do. So in a way, our own will becomes an idol in our life. You know, stubbornness toward God, thirdly, stubbornness toward God makes us also unteachable. When we get stubborn, we become unteachable. You know, the world is always 20 minutes ahead of one man in Coventry, England. In 1922, this man said the clocks were advanced 20 minutes. He said, I never accepted this. Nobody was going to take 20 minutes out of my life. Evidently, there was something wrong with the time in the, in, in the town, so they made a time adjustment. So here's what this guy did. He kept his watch on the old time. He is always, he, he, he is always, he, he is always 20 minutes late for every appointment. That's the way he lived his life. He was always 20 minutes late. As a result, this determined man uh, was fired from dozens of jobs. And the reason he was fired from jobs because he was always late. Uh, his, his attitude was this. They won't beat me. I am going to die 20 minutes late to show them I was right. And that's exactly what happened. This man was stubborn. He was unteachable, and it created problems for him in his life. And that's what happens when you are gripped with stubbornness in your life. Stubbornness can rob us of common sense. It can rob us of wisdom. Some, some individuals just insist on going through life, pushing doors that are marked, is that you? Are you going through life pushing on doors that are marked pool? No wonder you're having all kinds of problems in your life. Through my lifetime, I never cease to be amazed at the thinking or the reasoning of backslidden people. They have no wisdom. They have no common sense at all. It is as, it, it is as if they are bent on destroying themselves and they really don't care if they do destroy themselves you can warn them you can plead with them but they won't listen Proverbs 513 says and have not obey obeyed the voice of my teachers nor incline my ear to them that instructed me that's a verse that describes a stubborn person Isaiah said in Isaiah 30, verse 9, that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord. They refuse to listen to it. You know, when Pharaoh saw that relief had come from one of the plagues, Pharaoh became stubborn. He refused to listen to Moses and to Aaron, just as the Lord had predicted. In fact, Ecclesiastes 4.13 says, Better is a poor and a wise child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished. And there are people today, you cannot teach them anything. They will not be admonished. They will not be instructed. And they end up ruining their life. Now, there's a fourth thing. Look at Jeremiah chapter 5. Let's go there tonight, Jeremiah 5. We see that stubbornness 
makes us unwilling to submit to the Lord because we are proud and, and arrogant. We're unwilling to submit to the Lord because we're proud and arrogant. Look at Jeremiah said, Jeremiah 5, 3. He says, O Lord, are not thine eyes upon the truth? Thou hast stricken them, but they have not grieved. Thou hast consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than a rock. They have refused to return. That was the condition of God's people. God says, man, I, 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 I've spanked them, but they won't cry. Have you, ever, have you ever had that happen to you? Where you spanked one of your kids and they refused to cry? Huh? I've had, I've had a, a child like that and everything. And I thought, man, I must be getting really lousy at this, you know, and stuff. But, but I had one child, man, I, I tell you what, they were determined not to cry. And I was just determined to make them cry, you know. But that was the condition in, in, in the nation. God's people were being chastened, and they refused to fudge. Now, Romans 10.3 says, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. That's people today. It makes us unwilling to submit to the Lord. The big problem in America today and right now is, it, yeah, we have a lot of problems in Washington, but the big problem in America right now is people unwi are unwilling to do what the Lord wants them to do. Christians and lost people alike. That's the problem. Now, we come to a fifth thing. Stubbornness toward God leaves us unfulfilled. God uses our own stubbornness to chasten us when we refuse to obey Him. Sometimes the best way to convince a man that he is wrong is to let that man have his own way. Getting your own way can become a burden. How many of you found that out? You say, how many of you ever been in a position where you say, man, why did I wish for that? Why did I do that? Why did I want that? You know, getting your own way can become a burden, leaving you unfulfilled, dissatisfied, or miserable. Getting your own way is not always the best thing for you. It can leave you empty. And it can also create further problems for you by the foolish choices that you make in your life. If I could have the prodigal son here tonight, he would testify to that. He got his own way, but he ruined his life in doing so. You know, Psalm 8111 says, But my people would not hearken to my voice. And Israel would none of me. In other words, they would have nothing to do with me. So I gave them up unto their own heart's lust. And they walked in their own counsel. So how did God discipline his people? He let them have what they wanted. And that eventually became a form of discipline in their life. You know, the word the words own heart's lust can also be translated stubborn heart or stubborn way. Psalm 106, 15 says, And he gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. Oh yeah, they got what they wanted, but it didn't satisfy them. Jeremiah 18, 12. And they said, there is no hope, but we will walk after our own devices and we will everyone do the imagination of his evil heart. You know, the word imagination can also be rendered as stubbornness. You know, David himself said in Psalm 32, verse 3, that when he kept silent, when he dug in and turned a deaf ear concerning his sins. It took a toll on him physically. He said that his bones waxed old. His body wasted away. He experienced the burden of a devastated body. You know, Charles Spurgeon said, God does not permit his children 
to sin successfully. That's quite a statement. Our sinfulness takes a toll on us. Sin is like a serpent. The person that covers it is only keeping it warm so that it can sting with its venom later on with destructive and damaging consequences. David said that his bones waxed old. His strength was exhausted at his, as his body was aging quickly from the effects of his guilt. In fact, the word used here, render, the words used to render the, the phrase waxed old here would denote decay or the wearing out of the strength by slow decay. And that is what sinful living does. That's what rebellion does. It devastates your body. It just sucks the life out of you. Beloved, the Lord has a way of turning the screws and putting pressure on us to get our attention. Job spoke of God's hand of pressure in his own life. He said in Job 13, 21, Withdraw thy hand from me, and let not thy dread make me afraid. Psalm 39.10 says, Remove thy stroke away from me. I am consumed by the blow of thy hand. The pressure that David was under was continual both day and night. That pressure would not go away. It may have seemed at first that he had gotten away with the murder of Uriah and his adulterous affair with Bathsheba, but he was not off the hook. God was working behind the scenes where no man could see. He was working in David's heart. He was working in David's mind. Everything was not hunky-dory and fun, 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 fun for David. He was drying up on the inside. His health was deteriorating under the stress and the guilt from his sin. And beloved, when you live that way, guilt works on you. It just drains you physically. You can't sleep. You don't have any rest. You don't have any peace in your life. You know, they were doing a thing on Michael Jackson tonight. They were interviewing the doctor that who was his doctor. And I was shaving as I was listening to the news, but I caught something that really got my attention. He, says, he said that M Michael Jackson's room was absolutely filthy. It stunk. It was had clothes everywhere. And the reason it was this way, because he did not trust anybody. And he didn't trust anybody to come in and clean his room. He was a man who had billions of dollars, but he didn't trust anybody. You know, beloved, when you get away from God, that's what happens in your life. I don't know if Michael was a Christian. I don't think he was. I could be wrong. I'm not his judge. All I can do is go by how he lived. But I know that that man at the end of his life was a tormented man. So tormented that he had to live his life on drugs. He had to use drugs to, to get to sleep, to wake him up. But he was a man who lived in squalor because he didn't trust anybody. There's a man that doesn't have any peace in his life. You know, through the years, I've had to deal with wives whose husbands were unfaithful. And they would ask me, why doesn't God deal with my adulterous husband? Or why does God not deal with my adulterous wife? I've had to deal with cases like that. They ask, why are they getting away with what they're doing? And I tell them, they're not getting away with it. God is putting pressure on that husband or on that wife even though you may not see it just mark it down God's working 
They are not getting away with their rebellion, with their wickedness, with their adultery. They're not getting away with it at all. They are miserable, and mark it down, they're wasting away on the inside. Mentally, they are exhausted from fighting with God. And financially, their sin has sifted their wealth to the point of almost utter poverty and waste. In every case, sin always ch catches up with a husband or wife that lives in adultery. They never, never get away with it. Beloved, I want to assure you that God has a way of putting pressure on us. If we are rebellious until we get right with him or until we die, until we die his conviction and his power has a way of driving, drying us up physically and mentally. David's strength evaporated like water in summer heat. Let me, let me ask you this. Have, have you done something in your past that you have refused to get right with God or with other people? If so, you are afflicted with health problems, physically, emotionally, or mentally. God has a way of afflicting. If there are things in your, in your past that you have not dealt with, then you need to deal with them. You need to get them right. If you need to get some things right with people, then get them right. If you need to get some things right with the Lord, then get those things right too. In doing so, that is where you're going to enjoy delight and deliverance. If you don't, your strength will continue to wither away in your life. Mark it down. It will happen. You will lose your strength. Realize that your unwillingness to clear your conscience and repent will lead to further weakness in your life. God will not be mocked. He will not let you mock him. Galatians 6, 7 says, be not deceived. That's the first problem. We deceive ourselves into thinking we're going to get away with our sin or we're going to cover up and, and everything's going to be fine. That's a lie. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now, what does Paul mean by the word mocked? It comes from the word mukurizo, and it means to turn up the nose to deride, to sneer, or to outwit. You cannot turn up your nose at God and get away with it. You cannot outwit the Lord. You can't sneer at Him. You can't deride Him and get away with it. It's not going to happen. You may think that you know more than the Lord, but you don't. He will not be outwitted. He will not be derided, and He will not be mocked. At all. It's not going to happen. You know, in the 19th century, Marie de Agoul let her children, uh, left her children to follow after the most famous pianist of her day. It was Hungarian composer and virtuoso Franz Litz. And the, the ardor of her infatuation cooled, and the reality of missing her children set in. Marie is said to have made this observation as she was living in sin. She says, when one has smashed everything around oneself, one has also smashed one's self. When you destroy the lives of everyone around you, you also destroy yourself. Many of you recall that guy on television who was lots of fun to watch, his name was Steve Irwin. Steve Irwin, known around the world as the Crocodile Hunter, was killed on September 4th, 2006. It seems like yesterday. He was killed while filming wildlife along the Great Barrier Reef. And his death serves as a lesson on both the consequences of our actions and the tenuous reality of human life. Irwin was best known for the widely popular, wildly dangerous antics on Crocodile Hunter. That was a TV show. 
uh, during the 14 years that the documentary was on air, Steve Irwin survived countless snake bites being chased up a tree by a Komodo dragon. Has that happened to you lately? He was chased up the tree by a Komodo dragon. He was spit in the face by a red spitting cobra. And he was pulled into the water by a massive crocodile. All that happened to this guy. At the time of Steve's death, he was in the Great Barrier Reef to film a documentary on the ocean's deadliest creatures. That was the film. It was one of the uh, uh, spots that they had used for this, this program. But ironically, it was one of the ocean's least harmful creatures that delivered Mr. Irwin's fatal blow. He wasn't killed by a dangerous creature. It was basically a very gentle one. Due to the poor weather, his team stopped the filming for the Ocean's Deadliest Creature series. So Steve decided to do some work for a children's show, a kid's show, that was being hosted by his eight-year-old daughter. She was the host of the show. Her name was Bindi. While swimming with his cameraman, he came across a five-foot stingray, and he began to follow along behind the stingray. Stingrays are often called the pussycats of the sea because of their docile, gentle nature. In fact, they can be hand-fed by tourists on excursions from cruise liners. Unfortunately, Mr. Irwin got a little too close to that stingray, and it thrust its poisonous, barbed tail upward in a defensive reflex. The 10-inch serrated barb went into Mr. Irwin's chest, and it pierced his heart. He was the only the 17th person in the world to have been known to be killed by a stingray. If the blow had struck almost anywhere else, if he'd been hit anywhere else on the body, he would have very easily survived. But that stingray got him right in the heart. He was rushed to the nearest island and picked up by a medical helicopter, but he was dead. There was no hope for him. Steve played with danger and eventually was destroyed by it when he least expected it. And the same holds true for us when we play with danger too, when we play with sin. If we play with sin, whether it's drunkenness, drugs, sexual immorality, gambling, or pornography, it will hurt you. It will hurt. It may look fun, it may look pleasant and exciting and docile, but sin has a sting in its tail, and it will smite our heart. It can strike and ruin our lives when we least expect it. We can become entangled in its thorns or sinking in quicksand before we even realize it. And then when we realize it, it's too late. Our lives have been severely scarred and damaged. Solomon warned us about the consequences of being stubborn and defiant toward God and having that attitude. Lord, I don't need you and I'm going to do my own thing and I'm not going to let anybody tell me what to do. Solomon warned us about that. He said in Proverbs 29.1, he said, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly, suddenly, suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. The person who refuses to be teachable 
or heed cautions and warnings will fail. And Solomon assures us that this kind of stubbornness, it leads to sudden destruction. You know, that word destruction there, it has a very strong meaning to it. It comes from the word shabar, and it means to shatter or break into pieces. To crush or to violently tear apart. And that's exactly what Satan wants to do with your life. The Bible is full of people whose lives were shattered. Because they would not heed caution, they would not heed correction. The list includes the people, for example, that Noah warned there at the flood. The Pharaoh of Egypt, the sons of Korah, the sons of Eli, Belshazzar, Ahab, Jezebel, Judas, Samson, the list goes on. In Samson's case, he would not listen to the cautions of his parents, and he shortened his life. Now, why does this shattering, why does that happen to a person's life? Usually the reason people are shattered is because they're being corrected or punished in the first place for the things that they are doing. Those things that they are doing, the things they're being corrected about are, those, are the same things that are destroying their life. The reason somebody will warn somebody about liquor is because the liquor is destroying their life. The reason somebody's warned about drugs is because the drugs are warning their life. And the people say, no, I'm not going to listen to you. So the drugs and the liquor and whatever continues to destroy. You know, an example of sudden destruction from stubbornness is seen in the life of a guy named Henry Nelson. Henry lived in Wilmington, Delaware. He was a veteran of World War II. He had served as an instructor in the Army Chemical Warfare Department. That's where he served. Yet he ignored a warning by the superintendent of the Riverside Housing Development that the apartment that he lived in was being fumigated with hydrogen cyanide gas. He tore down the barricade that was over the door as they were gassing the building. And he went inside, and the reason he went inside the building, he went in there to get two blankets. He did not heed the warning, even though he was putting his life on the line. The, the neighbor saw this man remove the sign and the barricade from the door and go in, so they called the development office and told them what was going on. And when the employees arrived, it was too late. Nelson lay sprawled on the living room floor with two blankets in his arms. And despite both written and verbal warnings, and despite training in the army, he had gone to his death. Why? Because he thought he could get away with it. He thought, those warnings don't apply to me. And it destroyed him. Now, these warnings apply to you and me. They apply to all of us. And if we tear them down or ignore them, we're going to mess up our life. We're going to destroy ourselves. You know, people realize right now, man, I tell you what, you don't get away with sin. There are people today, it seems like they are getting away with it, but they're not. It's a matter of time. Just mark it down. <laughs> Stubbornness will ruin your life. That's why you want to keep your heart soft and tender. As a wife, you want to make sure you don't get stubborn toward your husband. It'll destroy your marriage. Men, as a, as a man, you want to make sure you don't get stubborn toward God because you're leading your family. Kids, you don't want to get stubborn toward your parents because it'll hurt your relationship with your parents. None of that. You're going to make decisions that are going to scar your life, but none of that. It's going to hurt your mom and dad. Don't let your heart get hard. Realize that stubbornness always causes us to lose when we rebel against God in our life. There is no way you're going to win when you get stubborn with God. <laughs>